Good morning. It is 8.30 on Tuesday, April 4th. I'm Jay White, and for Desiree Frazier, and this is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, the Speaker of the House reflects on his last legislative session with the gavel. Then the Lieutenant Governor discusses the final session of his term and assesses the Senate's work. Plus, as House Bill 1020 heads to the Governor's civil rights groups, I potential litigation. From MPB News, this is Mississippi Edition on Think Radio. When the Mississippi legislature adjourned sign a die over the weekend, it marked the end of the speakership for Philip Gunn. The Republican from Clinton took the gavel in 2012 and was the first Republican to serve as Speaker of the Mississippi House since 1876. In a recap of the session with members of the media, Gunn said a main priority this session was passing legislation that supported women and children. As you know, when Roe versus Wade was overturned last summer, I formed a Speaker's Commission on Life, and we set out to draft and create a number of laws in response to that that we view to be pro-life, pro-family, pro-mother uh, and child. And so I'm very proud of the work that that committee did. Um, I want to acknowledge those members. I know y'all probably can't list them all in your articles, but Angela Cockerham, Jill Ford, Kevin Felsher, Lee Yancey, Otis Anthony, Sam Mims, Missy McGee, Cedric Burnett, and Dana McLean. Uh, they all came together last summer after I made that announcement, and we set out to look at a lot of different areas and address what we viewed to be very much pro-family, pro-life pieces of legislation. Uh, one of the biggest ones was House Bill 1671. This was the tax incentive pa- package, a lot of tax credits in that for private businesses and individuals so that they could donate resources to help meet the needs of mothers and children. We increased the pregnancy resource tax credit from 3.5 to $10 million. That is a and a great example, I think, of how we can incentivize a private sector solution to a public need without growing government, without expending more, creating a new program or a new government agency or uh, expending more taxpayer dollars. So that is an incredibly popular tax credit. I think it's going to serve well around the state, these crisis pregnancy centers. Um, we also did a $10 million tax credit for transitional homes. We also did a $4 million tax credit for charitable clinics around the state. Then we did a tax credit for child care expenses up to equal to 25% of the federal credit. This is another incentive or another idea we had about helping young mothers who uh, are looking to support themselves, support their children. This gives them additional help to defray those child care expenses. So those are four major tax things that we passed in the Speaker's Commission on Life or out of the Speaker's Commission on Life that will serve to help the financial needs of mothers and children around the state. The Speaker's final session did not pass without some heated rhetoric and impassioned debate. The final days of the session bled into the late hours of the night. That included the final vote on the conference report for House Bill 1020. Gunn reflected on that legislation as well as his career serving in the House. Well, as I said on my last day, I think every one of us who serves in public office, regardless of where you serve, wants to think that your service made a difference, that Mississippi is a better place than it was when you started, that uh, over the the time of your service, whether you're a city council person or a um, a school board member or a legislator, you want to think that your time of service made a difference. I do believe we've made significant strides in Mississippi. I think Mississippi is a better place today for a number of reasons. Um, But I do believe changing the state flag was a huge step towards resolving racial tensions in our state. I saw, ever since we did that, a much better atmosphere in the House. I think we debated issues from a policy perspective, not a racial perspective. Now, 1020, I believe uh, 
it was attempted by some to turn that into a racial issue, but it candidly is not. We have a city that is uh, struggling to manage the crime. That's not, an, uh, that's not a subjective opinion. St statistics bear that out. I think you see where we rank nationally on the criminal side. And the perception out in the community is that it is a, a, um, out of control and needs to be addressed. We saw the water situation um, that, that existed. So the attempts by the legislature were simply attempts to try to address needs within our capital city. And I think Nick Bain said it in his debate Friday night that the capital city belongs to all of us. It is our, it is the face of the state of Mississippi, and we all want it to succeed. We all want it to thrive. We all want it to prosper. These are those two issues are, are two issues that desperately need to be addressed. And 1020 was an attempt to do that. Gunn has announced he will not be seeking re-election to the House of Representatives, but has hinted he has future plans to consider ser or to continue serving the state of Mississippi. Coming up, the lieutenant governor discusses the final session of his term and assesses the Senate's work. This is Mississippi Edition on Think Radio. Hey, this is Larry Morrissey with the Mississippi Arts Commission. I'm one of the hosts of the Mississippi Arts Hour, the arts interview show on Think Radio. We talk with visual artists, musicians, writers, as well as people who help bring the arts to their communities. We hear about how each artist learned their craft and get some insight into their creative process. You can hear the Arts Hour every Sunday at 5 p.m. on Think Radio, or listen anytime by subscribing to the show through your favorite podcasting app. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Jay White, and for Desiree Fraser this morning. Delbert Hoseman was elected lieutenant governor in 2019 after serving 12 years as Mississippi's Secretary of State. This weekend, he completed the final legislative session of the term. Hoseman says during his time presiding over the Senate, the chamber has been looking to make gener generational investments, and this session was no different. He highlights a major infrastructure investment as, as an example. This is the largest infrastructure package we've had probably in decades. Over $600 million is going into this, including emergency road and bridges for our counties, as well as accelerating two whole years of construction, plus a third in 2025, we're accelerating the construction in DeSoto County of I-55 and Highway 7 in Oxford. Uh, those are paid from funds that we have here in Mississippi, that we have accelerated our, edu our program for roads and bridges. And I'm very proud of the legislature taking that step, uh, $450 million for large-scale highway, $40 million for matching funds. Uh, Senator Wicker, Senator Hyde-Smith have gotten us money. We have to match $40 million to get $200 million more, uh, and that's not included in that number. $30 million for strategic multimodal. That's our road. That's our railroads and our, uh, as well as our ports and harbors, and $100 million for the emergency road and bridge program. It's a staggering amount of money. Hoseman also says those long-term solutions are evident in the other legislation the Senate prioritized. That includes continued gains in educational investment and a new program to help municipalities fund water system improvements. Uh, as you all know, we spent a lot of time on education. We have the last four years, and you can see how we have strategically gone forward with education. The first year was a COVID year. The next year, we got a $1,000 teacher pay raise to let the teachers know that we were coming, that we were working on. The next year, four or $5,000 teacher pay raise, huge amount of money, $240 million for teachers. This year, over $100 million is being spent in addition to their normal funding for education in Mississippi. Those are the seats of the future. That's where we need to be spending our money. I was very proud of the fact we did that. On our American Rescue Plan, it worked even better than we thought it would. Uh, when we got our American Rescue Plan money, what we did was we, we said we will match what the cities put in the ground or the counties put in the ground. If you build water and sewer, you use your money. They got $900 million. If you use your money, we'll take our money and match what it is. That program was so successful, we had to add another $41 million to $450 million that we had already allocated. Almost a billion dollars. 
in water and infrastructure in Mississippi. Sorely needed, probably never would have happened without this joint venture that we did with them. Very, very pleased with the fact that we were able to use our American Rescue Plan money that we've got long time, long term results. The last week of the legislative session was bookended by weekends of severe weather that caused major devastation throughout the state. Hoseman said after visiting Rolling Fork two weeks ago, he continued visiting storm impacted areas once the session ended. I spent uh, Saturday um, in Amory uh, going over with the mayor. Um, the issues they had in visiting with the residents who had had, had, had tremendous losses there. Their school um, baseball field was damaged. Their school has come back some. It, uh, they had roof damage, but it wasn't as bad as I, I think initially we thought from the pictures. Uh, and, of course, uh, like Mississippi, uh, Saltello offered them their baseball field of practice. So it's just a neighborhood. That's where we are. So I was real pleased with that, and I was really excited to do that. We we appropriated eighteen and a half million dollars for relief. Um, a million and a half of that went to the hospitals. I think Rolling Fork will get the majority of that. Then the other was MEMA, and then direct cash to the to the counties and whatnot. Saturday afternoon, I went to um, Cooper Tire, and it took a direct hit. Um, they worked twenty four seven. They're one of the the biggest tire manufacturers in the country is Cooper Tire. And I, I went to the factory and met with their factory manager and the people doing the cleanup and went through uh, what had to be done. Uh, that They had 700 people working there when it hit at 1 o'clock in the morning. It is a miracle that we didn't have a loss of life. They had tornado shelters and they all fled to those. But that place is not, it will not be able to produce tires. Now, when you're working 24-7 and you get closed, um, that's, that is a horrendous event. But we have been challenging Mississippi in the last week. And, um, uh, you know, the best thing we've got is our people. Hoseman will seek re-election for a second term, and he's getting a primary challenger in Senator Chris McDaniel. Hoseman reflected on how the Senate has grown as a body over the last four years, but he recognizes how the debate around House Bill 1020 has re-injected some polarization into the chamber. I took a look at the the first court, the self-appointed court, was not acceptable to the Senate, so it went away. So the, then uh, the second court was a, basically a municipal court to have take care of misdemeanors, basically, and then your preliminary work on a felony arrangement, so it's not really there. The second thing is we've been paying three, uh, three judges here uh, for the last two years. I mean, this is not new. We, we had a horrendous back, backlog here, and we got the judges up, and we started paying them. And so that's, there's nothing new about that. Uh, the size of the police force is going up and was scheduled to go up to 150. Uh, I will tell you the, um, the court system is, has term limited. I mean, we've got about two years to help, and if they, don't, if they don't need that help in the full two years, I don't intend, intend to fund them. So we're... Those systems were here to help the city of Jackson. As you know, I've lived here half a century. Um, we hope and we deserve to have a capital city that's safe, and we deserve to have a judicial system that works, and we need to have enforcement of the laws of whatever the city or the state say the laws are. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that we made more progress on that. Um, the political part of it was hard to watch because we had made a lot of progress here, uh, whatever the, your race, color, creed, or party was. And it was hard to watch that from the podium where our senators were fighting. And then, of course, in the House, went on forever. Uh, that was very difficult. But I think uh, as we work through these issues, uh, I think you'll find the, the municipal court system will be helpful to the city. I think the uh, police additional police officers will be helpful to the city. Uh, I think getting primary jurisdiction and so that, that others that know where they are is helpful in getting those kind of things squared away. Um, our, our goal would be to have the city come back to where, where, where we didn't have to spend any additional funds on anything like this. That is Delbert Hoseman. After the break, as House Bill 1020 heads to the governor, civil rights groups I potential litigation. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. 
Hello, I'm Dr. Nancy Lotridge Anderson, president of New Perspectives, a fee-only financial advising firm and co-host of Money Talks. For over 10 years, Money Talks has been answering your personal financial questions and sharing knowledge about money management. Money Talks can be heard Tuesdays at 9 a.m. on MPB Think Radio. Podcasts can be found on our website, money.mpbonline.org, or on your smart device's podcasting platform. Welcome back. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Jay White in for Desiree Frazier. Civil rights advocacy groups are considering their options now that a bill that will put unelected judges and more Capitol Police in Jackson has passed the state legislature. Jarvis Dorch is the executive director of the ACLU in Mississippi. He tells our Lacey Alexander the passage of House Bill 1020 could bring several consequences. It's clear from the day this bill was filed um, that there are a number of issues with this legislation. There have been some changes um, in the language uh, since, you know, the bill was filed and now passed. But, you know, there are a few things that just remain the same. There are some questions around how this bill is going to impact voting rights in the city of Jackson. Is it racially motivated or intended to dilute black voting strength? Uh, Does it violate the state constitution? Has the legislature gone above its authority to create these temporary courts. Um, those are the type of issues that you know folks have been dealing with since this bill was filed. And even with those changes that have been put in place, uh, those questions still remain. There was a lot of pushback to the bill from Jackson representatives, from Jackson residents, uh, from entities like yourself. Why do you think the bill passed anyway? Um, I mean, you have a, a legislature that Based on the numbers, they can pass pretty much anything they want, right? They can, um, if they want to do something in that legislature, there's usually, if it can be viewed as partisan, um, racial, unfortunately, those issues, you know, are going to pass if, if there's not uh, an effort by leadership, either the speaker or lieutenant governor, to stop the bill. Um, so we didn't see that happen in in the legislature this year. So uh, even despite the voices of so many people from Jackson who spoke against this bill, the lawmakers that live in Jackson Jackson that spoke against this bill, um, when there are individuals in in power up there and decide that they're going to do something, you know, there's nothing to stop them from doing it when they have the votes to do it. And like you said earlier, the bill has seen a lot of changes since it was first introduced. Which of those changes, if any, were you happy with or unhappy with? Um, I can't say of any. I mean, I think that you just changed the aspects of it a little bit. There's still, you know, before you had these permanent judges. Now you have some judges that are in theory temporary, but you have more of them. And you still have another permanent judge. Um, the final version of the bill actually expands the authority of the Capitol Police more than the initial version. Uh, so they have authority to, you know, jurisdiction over the entire city. Before it was just doing, it was limited to the improvement district. Um, so nothing really has gotten better about the bill. We, we are happy that there's more resources going to the Hines County DA. But again, those resources could have been. Um, provided in a separate vehicle uh, that, you know, you didn't, that didn't require them putting forward a bill that is such a destructive act against voting rights in Mississippi. When I talked to lawmakers at the Capitol who were in support of the bill, their retort to me was, well, this is about crime. This is about crime in Jackson. What is your response to that reasoning? I mean, that's that's a real lazy response to it, right? You can just say, you know, you're going to do anything and justify by saying, you know, it's about crime. I mean, what what's the metric for, for crime? What does that mean? It's about crime. And why why is this the solution to crime? You know, there wasn't any data given to say that there's a backlog that necess- uh, makes it necessary for these many judges to be put in place for a temporary basis. There's no evidence about how Capitol Police – is working to prevent crime. Um, There was no discussion about instead of spending this money here, why don't we spend it in another area and help the Jackson Police Department? You know, one of the supporters of this bill, uh, especially on the Senate side, spoke in favor of the bill and said, you know, the legislature doesn't give money to police departments. 
And a couple of days later, later in his district, there was a bill to give Pasagula $2 million for his police department. So there is the ability for the legislature to invest in these cities and not come into cities and just take over. Uh, that That's what citizens of Jackson wanted, to see lawmakers actually invest in Jackson instead of coming in and dividing up the city. And a common comment that I've gotten from people who disagree with the bill is that it feels like state overreach. It doesn't feel like they're supporting Jacksonians. It feels like they're taking matters into their own hands when they don't really have a right to. Do you agree with that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, if you want public policy to work, you know, the people in that community have to have some buy-in. They have to be engaged in, like, on the issue. Otherwise, we're not going to trust the, the process. We're not going to trust the outcomes. We know there are going to be bad things that happen as a result of this bill. There are going to be bad things that happen with JPD as a result of how they operate. But when those things happen and, and there's no trust, that's going to create a lot of disruption in the city. We've already had four individuals shot, one killed by Capitol Police, and very little facts that come from it. So we have the legislature kind of double down on, hey, disregarding, we're going to disregard the thoughts and considerations of the voters of Jackson. You know, it makes you feel like you're being dictated to and that you don't really have a say in how your city operates. And your vote really doesn't matter as much as someone else's. Now that the legislation is officially on the governor's desk and will most likely be approved, what are the next steps for activists and advocates like the ACLU now that this law is pretty much in place? Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, it goes without saying that a lot of groups and individuals and organizations are going to be looking at, you know, what parts of this this act are unconstitutional, whether they violate the federal constitution, federal law, or whether or not they violate state the state constitution. Um, that Those are just questions that are still out there. Uh, people have been looking at that since the bill was filed, but, you know, there there is going to be... Uh, there's definitely going to be some litigation concerning this bill. There's going to be litigation about a number of things that the Mississippi legislature did um, during this session. So, you know, it's, litigation is often the backstop for preventing some bad things to happen in a state like Mississippi. Um, you're probably going to see that again uh, following the 2023 leg- legislative session. And last question for you, for the residents of Jackson that are concerned or maybe even a little bit fearful now that this bill is passed, what is your message to those residents? We have an election in November. Um, Capitol Police reports to the governor. You know, if Capitol Police reports directly to the commissioner of public public safety, who is appointed by the governor of the state, Um you know, they, if you feel like your vote has been reduced by this bill, there's a way to take some of that back by coming out and voting in November for, for a governor that's going to actually respect your um, ability to govern your own city. Jarvis Dorch with the ACLU, thank you so much. Right, thank you.